A frame buffer object is an object made up of one or more image attachments, and these image attachments come in four kinds. There are color attachments, depth attachments, stencil, and depth stencil, which is a combination of depth and stencil interleaved into one buffer. Per pixel, that's generally 24 bits of depth, followed by 8 bits for stencil. These image attachments come in two kinds. They are either textures or render buffer objects. Unlike textures, render buffers have no mid maps, they have no layers or tiling, they don't have texture parameters, and they cannot be sampled, and so you cannot read from them from your shaders. A render buffer very simply just stores the pixels one after the other in the most straightforward way possible, making them optimal for cases where you just want to read and write a bunch of pixels en masse, but this simple layout makes them inefficient for sampling, and so you're not allowed to sample from them. Now, the so-called default frame buffer object is created for us, and this has four color attachments, what's called front left, front right, back left, and back right. And assuming we're doing non-stereoscopic but double buffered rendering, then it's the front left, which is currently displayed on screen. Meanwhile, we render into back left, and when we're done rendering, then we swap the two buffers. If we're doing stereoscopic rendering, such as for VR, then we would use left for left eye and right for the right eye. Either way, this default frame buffer is generally configured to have a depth and stencil attachment, and this is not actually automatic, but it's something that's done for us by GLFW. So in practice, we're not gonna to have to set it up ourselves. So far in our examples, we've just been using the default frame buffer, but it's possible to create and use other frame buffers. The default frame buffer is always what ends up on screen, but we might sometimes want to render into so-called off-screen frame buffers for various purposes, such as applying post-processing effects or doing things like deferred rendering, which is something we'll describe in a much later video. In example 5.1 frame buffers, we're not rendering anything new before. It's just a quad for the floor here and then these two boxes. But what's not evident on screen here is that we're actually first rendering into an off-screen frame buffer, a separate frame buffer that we explicitly have created, and then we're using the color attachment of that frame buffer as a texture to render the image out into the default frame buffer. For the default frame buffer, we're just setting up a simple quad that encompasses our whole view, rendering this other texture onto the quad, which has the effect then of copying the contents from the off-screen frame buffer's color attachment into the default frame buffer's color attachment. Surely you would think there's a more direct way to copy data from one frame buffer to another, and in fact, actually there are, Yet, uh, depending upon your OpenGL driver and, and your system, it tends to be the case that this is the most efficient way to do it. But the other reason to do it this way is now we can apply so-called post-processing effects. When rendering the off-screen frame buffer's texture into the default frame buffer, we can have our fragment shader for that rendering to apply some fancy effects, as we'll discuss. First thing though, let's look at how to create and set up a second frame buffer. We start very simply by creating the frame buffer object itself and then creating its two attachments. First, the color attachment, which will be a texture, just like we've seen before. And then the depth and stencil attachment will make just a render buffer object because we're not going to need to sample from it. The general rule is that if you don't need to sample from an image attachment, it might as well be a render buffer object. And so it should then, in theory, be slightly more efficient though I've seen conflicting information of whether that really pans out. It turns out that the hardware is actually really good at reading and writing into textures, and so I believe on many modern GPUs it's not really going to make a difference. But maybe I have bad information on that, so don't take my word for it. Anyway, for our color texture here, you may note that for the texture parameters we're not setting any wrapping mode, because that's going to be irrelevant for our purposes. Notice that the format is RGB with no alpha, and the width and height are the same as our screen output. For the depth and stencil render buffer, we simply generate the render buffer here, bind it so that it's active for the subsequent call of render buffer storage. And this is what actually allocates the buffer. So we specify its format, 24 bits of depth, eight bits of stencil, and its dimensions. Having created both the texture and render buffer, we then need to attach them. So we bind the frame buffer first, and when we do so, we have three options of how to bind it. GL draw frame buffer binds the frame buffer for write ops, GL read frame buffer for only read ops, and if you just say frame buffer, then it binds it for both. Write ops includes any rendering operations, like say GL draw arrays, 
Whereas read operations include some functions like uh, GL read pixels and a few other pixel transfer operations where we can copy data from one frame buffer into another. But this does not include when we sample from texture attachments. So in this example, when our fragment shader reads from the off-screen frame buffer as a texture by sampling, that frame buffer actually doesn't have to be bound at all because that's not relevant for that purpose. For our purposes, we're not going to do any of these read ops here, so we'll just use draw frame buffer. And so we call frame buffer texture 2D to attach our color texture as the color attachment zero. Again, a frame buffer can have multiple color attachments. So there's zero, one, two, three, four, and I believe it's guaranteed in the spec that you will have at least eight color attachments, I believe. Though on some systems, I believe you can go beyond that limit. It's uncommon though to need more than eight. And in this case, we just need the one. And then anyway, we call GL frame buffer render buffer to attach the render buffer as a depth stencil attachment. Notice there's no number zero here because you never have more than one of these on any frame buffer. And lastly, we can call GL check frame buffer status to check if our frame buffer is complete, meaning that it's validly configured. It has a valid set of attachments. And in the event here that it is incomplete, we'll print out this error message. Doing this check is not required, but it's good for debugging if you're doing anything complicated with frame buffers. And now looking down at the render loop, first thing every frame is we want to render into the off-screen frame buffer. So we make sure that is currently bound for drawing. We also need to make sure that depth testing is enabled because as you'll see, we're actually going to disable it when we render into the default frame buffer. Here we're clearing the currently bound frame buffer, the off-screen frame buffer. And then all this is just rendering as normal. We're rendering our scene. Having rendered everything into the off-screen frame buffer, now we want to actually render it into the default frame buffer so that we can see it on screen. And so we bind the default frame buffer with zero. The integer ID for the default frame buffer is always zero. We disable depth testing. We clear, in this case, only the color buffer. We don't care about the depth buffer because we're not using the depth buffer of the default frame buffer, so no need to clear it. And then we'll do our rendering, this time using a different shader program than what we used to actually render into the off-screen frame buffer. And we'll look at those shaders in a second. Our geometry is defined by this quad uh, vertex array object, which is just a single quad, as we'll look at in a moment. We then bind the texture color buffer, like we do for any texture. And then we draw our quad, which actually is made up of two triangles. So properly, I shouldn't call it a quad, but it's a rectangle. So before looking at the fragment shaders very quickly, what does a quad VAO look like? It's uh, the quad vertices here. It's two triangles whose vertices are defined in terms of clip space with no Z. There's only two dimensions here because we're actually just doing two dimensional rendering here. And then we have the corresponding texture coordinates. So there are two vertex attributes for the uh, quad VAO. Looking at the shaders for our off-screen rendering, the vertex shader is nothing we haven't seen before for just very ordinary flat lit rendering of textures and same with the fragment shader, just rendering out the texture color for the pixel. And then for our screen vertex shader, the one used to render out to the default frame buffer. In this case, we're not dealing with any transforms because our vertices are already in terms of clip space like we want, but they are vec twos rather than vec threes. So we're filling in for Z here, the value of zero. As for our screen fragment shader, it's exactly the same as our other fragment shader. We're just simply rendering out the texture onto the quad. What if, however, we don't simply render the texture verbatim, but apply some kind of effect? Well, that's what we call post-processing. After rendering out our scene as normal, we're then manipulating the color values before they reach the screen. Probably the very simplest post-processing effect is to simply invert all the colors which we can do here by simply uh, taking the vec4 returned by this texture call and subtracting it from one. This takes the RGB and A value returned by this texture call and subtracts them all from one, and that is the vec4 being assigned to frag color. So it's effectively inverting all the colors. So here we'll save and uh, rebuild. And if I run it, all the colors have been inverted which is not terribly interesting in this case because our original scene is all grayscale, but you can see that everything's inverted. Note that means that all the alpha values are zero, but uh, that doesn't matter for the output uh, color buffer. For something slightly more complicated, we can make the output grayscale. In this case, our pre-processed image is already grayscale, 
but let's pretend it weren't. Anyway, if you want to get the grayscale equivalent of any color value, you simply take the R, G, and B and average them together and make that average your new R, G, and B values. Now, the simple technique for grayscale does work, but it's generally not ideal because when it comes to our light perception of colors, we're more sensitive to green, less so for red, and even less so for blue. And so what we want to do is actually a weighted averaging of these different components. And so what we actually want looks more like this. Multiply the red by 0.21, the green by 0.71, because it's the, the strongest component we want for the average, and then blue only by 0.07. So blue is actually contributing quite little to this average, but that's actually what we want because of human perception. Let me actually just demonstrate this here. Rebuild, and we run it. And as far as I can tell, this is exactly the same as it was before, which is good, I suppose, because it was grayscale to begin with, and you wouldn't want your grayscale filter to uh, somehow change the image if it's already grayscale. To achieve a lot of interesting post-processing effects, we can use what's called a convolution matrix, or more commonly just called a kernel. And the idea is that we sample not just from our pixel coordinate, but also from neighboring points to the top, left, bottom, right, and to the top, left, top, right, bottom, left, and bottom, right. We then multiply these nine samples by the nine different weights specified by our kernel, and then we add these all together to get our final output color. So here, for example, we have a kernel that'll get us a sharpen effect where we take the center pixel itself and multiply it by nine, but then from the neighboring samples, we multiply them all by negative one, and when all these samples get added together, it has the effect of sharpening our image. And note that these neighboring points are not necessarily just a pixel distance away. They could be, sometimes that's what we want, but we can choose actually just any offset, and the configuration of this offset will effectively modify our effect. So we get different effects, not just by changing the weights in the kernel, but also by modifying this offset. In this case, we're using the same offset for vertical and horizontal dimensions, but in some cases, you may want to have separate vertical and horizontal offsets. You also probably want to tie the offset to the dimensions of your output image, which in this case, we're rendering out to 1920 by 1080. And so if our offset is 1 over 600, then in the horizontal dimension, at least, our offset is uh, about 2 pixels away from our center point. And in the vertical dimension, it's approximately 3. So if, say, we wanted to make sure the offset is actually one pixel in both the horizontal and vertical dimensions, we'd have to compute two separate offsets using the actual dimensions of our image. For our purposes here, we're just keeping things simple. So we've chosen an arbitrary offset. Anyway, to see this in action, I'm gonna build it here. And now I run it. And you can see we have this ugly looking sharpen effect. So that's neat. But if you look at the edge of the image, you'll notice something a little funny going on. Uh, what's happening is that by default, our image that we're sampling from, by default, it's doing wrapping. And so we're getting this odd effect at the border of our image. Uh, to fix that, we simply need to configure our texture color buffer to use uh, clamp to edge for the texture wrap parameter. So I'll build that, run it again. And now you can see at the edges, we've gotten rid of that problem. For one more example, if we change the kernel here, instead of a sharpen, we can get a blur effect. And this is achieved by weighting the corners to be 1 16th each, the top left, bottom right to be 2 16th each, and then the center itself to be 4 16ths. And you may note all these weights add up to one, which is usually the case for our kernels. Our sharpened kernel also added up to one. If they didn't add up to one, if instead they added up to something larger than one, we would effectively be lightening the pixels. If they add up to something less than one, we would be effectively darkening the pixels. In this case though, we don't want to darken or lighten the image, so our kernel weights add up to one. And now I will rebuild, run it again, and now we're getting blurry output.